What's up? What's up? Podcast world. What's up? Chad Belding back at you. Another episode. This life ain't for everybody. Thank you guys and girls so much for the subscriptions, the ratings, the reviews, the direct messages. Keep them coming. We'll keep the guests coming. We'll keep the conversations, the discussions and the topics flowing. Today's episode of This Life Ain't For Everybody podcast is brought to you by the McGeehee Brothers down in Louisiana, the Gator Cooler Clan, G-A-T-R, GatorCoolers.com. Check them out. Their assortment, their selection, their offerings, their colors, all of their innovation. Plus, the brand is just so cool. It's so uh, traditional with the um, support of the culture of the American outdoorsman conservationist, Hunter Fisher. They love it all. They're totally ingrained in it. They're a big partner of our TV shows here at The Foul Life, all of our social media efforts, our live events. And today's guest of This Life Ain't For Everybody is the co-founder of Gator Coolers, Mr. Brian McGeehee. What's up, bro? What's happening, brother? Good to be back. Now, uh, this, this is a podcast. We're filming it, and I don't know if we're going to need a bouncing ball on the bottom for the Cajun dialect. Um, the people just <laughs> listening to it are going to have to get an interpreter, I think. So I'll we apologize. Talk He'll talk slow today. What's going yeah. on? What's going on? And what is the correct pronunciation of the state you live in? Louisiana. Louisiana. Yeah. So, when, pe- so when people say Louisiana, that's wrong? Uh no, we'll, we'll accept that now, man. Times are tough, so we're not knocking people in their uh, enunciations right now. Because, you know, Nevada, you, a lot of people where you're from will say y'all are from Nevada. And yeah. that's totally wrong. And I, I don't get all upset. It's Nevada. But, like, guys like my brother, they get all irate and all heated like freaking Hulk Hogan on a freaking chocolate cake. Just, oh, oh, it's Nevada. <laughs> don't say it again. They get all fired up. Louisianans aren't like that. They're a little bit more relaxed and laid back, aren't they? Oh, absolutely not. We're usually a little bit high strung, but right now you got to be relaxed. Times are weird. So giving everybody a pass because of the COVID. Yeah. It's People really losing their minds, man. It got really bad in Louisiana because of Mardi Gras, they said, huh? That's my theory on it. Yeah. Uh, they're saying, you know, it's been around since uh, October, November. I've got several friends that are doctors here and I've been talking to them about it and kind of joining them on some efforts to uh, help people that have been diagnosed with the disease and sent home. And just talking with them, they're like, man, this stuff, we've been treating people all over the country since at least October with, you know, the same symptoms as the flu. They're tested negative. It's more of like it turns into a pneumonia. Don't know what to do. We send them home and treat them for the symptoms. And that's it. And uh, New Orleans, obviously really busy during Mardi Gras. People come from all over the world to come down and party for that weekend. So that's that's and plus it's a port for uh, cruises, cruise lines. So. I mean, it's a hot bed for everybody coming in all over the place. So it's, it's shut, not a surprise It's shut down now, I assume, right? Yeah. Now things are getting really crazy, but it's, in my opinion, kind of overkill, but I'm not a professional, so we'll leave do, it to them. Do you see any light at the end of the tunnel? Have you heard any positive reports lately from Trump or the administration or the doctors or the news networks and the media that makes you think that we might be seeing a little bit of light? Yeah, I try not to watch the news too much on it because that's with anything they try to uh, – create the hype and the hysteria. So I just mostly go right to the source. Luckily I have people that are at the source, but you know, our daily bed counts, the new cases, um, all that kind of stuff's going down. There's more and more and more stories that aren't even getting picked up. Actually a doctor friend of ours, his mother's 93 years old or 92, somewhere upper nineties or lower nineties, somewhere she's old. Okay. She got the disease kicked his butt, got uh, discharged. She's back on the street. They tried to do a story on that. You know, hopefully it'll give lift some spirits. Like the way the news talks now is if you get it, you're a goner, but uh, she survived it. And we're having a lot more cases like that. And the, the media here just isn't picking up on it, which is pretty frustrating. Well, yeah, I mean, they want everything to look negative to where, you know, of course they're going to blame it on, you know, who and the economy on, you know, who, right. and then they're going to try to yeah. do it. It's a, it's a, it's getting yeah. politicized, unfortunately. Oh yeah. It's an election year, boy. Yep. So let's, yeah, my thoughts are out to everybody. I'm trying to stay isolated. I'm practicing social distancing with my daughter. I'm just chilling out, staying at home, literally not going anywhere. Like people are like, your truck hasn't moved. I'm like, it's not going to, I'm going to abide by the leadership and follow their direction. The doctors and scientists. That's gotta be insane for you. Oh dude. I mean, I've never, (laughs) this is, I was talking with Chad Ward the other day, day before yesterday or whenever the art talk was. It's been at least 10 years that I've been home for this stretch, this long of a stretch. I believe it. Him too. So just crazy. Um, Let's talk about something that's positive, though, the growth of Gator. What's going on with that? Man, so it's 
it's very weird times. Like even though everybody's kind of stressed out, losing jobs, uh, losing a lot of stuff, losing money, losing the their way of living here, it's I almost don't want to even talk about it to a lot of people around here. I don't I don't want to be boastful or gloat about it, but we're freaking rolling. I mean, we just purchased the huge warehouse. We purchased a storefront. Uh, we're taking on investment, and things are getting crazy for us. What about you do a lot of things overseas? Has that affected you? Has that got you worried a little bit? Not at all. No. Not, nothing, huh? Mm -mm. Our manufacturers. So it, China's a big place, just like the United States is a big place. Um, the hardest hit areas of China aren't necessarily where our manufacturers are. Our manufacturers back running like nothing ever happened. Um, there's no extra steps as far as quarantine in the products. If you get your products flown in, you know, you might have a little bit, um, some hassle there because it gets here fast. But this stuff comes on a boat and takes 26 to 32 days, depending on which way we go. It's, it's quarantined itself on the boat. We don't have any kind of hiccups there. So you have, there's no hiccups at all. There's no dis like just any interruptions that go in between you and the factories and getting product on the containers and on the water and into the ports and delivered to Louisiana. Louisiana. Louisiana, yeah, Louisiana. none at all. Uh, my biggest concern with it, obviously, right now, everybody's like on the anti-China movement, which I can understand, uh, again, somewhat pushed by the media hysteria. But like I've been talking to him, man, I would love nothing else to in this huge facility we have now to have a machine right here that's physically making these coolers in Thibodeau, Louisiana. I would love that. It's not possible. We still it's, it's still insanely expensive. And our products would be $150, $200 more per size bigger. We wouldn't be able to go. Uh, we'd be more direct to consumer base instead of wholesale to retail. There's there's a lot of challenges with that. And they're saying, well, you should move to a different country. Well, what country would you suggest? Well, move to Mexico. We're getting better trade agreements with them. That's great. Whenever we get back on the, you know, Mexico screwing us with drugs and illegal immigrant story, then where do I go? Do I spend another million dollars and move? What, what would please everybody? So I think right now everybody's, I say everybody, there's a lot of people chirping about, you know, don't buy Chinese goods. I don't think people understand how reliant we are on commerce from all around the world. Now, I don't think it's smart for us to have our antibiotics mostly manufactured in China. I think that's really dumb, actually. But consumer products, shirts, shoes, clothes, uh, some foods, whatever. Chinese food, whatever. I mean, coolers, so what? But important stuff, I do think that's kind of goofy. To, yeah, it's a uh, double-edged sword. There. You know, Americans are it the is. first, you know, Americans are the first one of, is it made in America? You know, Bobby Pinson wrote that song, you know, pay a little more for a shirt with a tag in the back that says made it in the USA. USA. Yeah, And that's prideful. That sounds awesome, right? And then are, are consumers in this country dedicated and committed to that hell no absolutely not so they can no. talk all they want and say yep. i want to support an american brand and then when you see the cost of manufacturing employment here insurance benefits taxes everything that goes into running a business especially in manufacturing here um especially yep. like in, in in injection molded and stuff that you guys are dealing in it's very expensive and then when you up that msrp price the first thing they're going to say is that you priced yourself out of the market well y'all said you'd be loyal to us if we put made in the usa on it what if we yeah. say, what if we say assembled in the USA? What if we have all the parts shipped over here and we put them together? Will that make you feel better? Well, still, it's all, it's all relative and you just have to look at it, it like is. it's, it's, a, it's a crazy thought process that people can, you know, accuse you of we're anti-China. You got to be made in America. Well, yeah, then let's get our manufacturing there. I think there's yeah. some, I think there's some things being put in place that could get us there, but we're nowhere near it right now. Not even close. I think the biggest thing that people don't that the people that fuss about that, what they don't understand is, yes, there's six guys in China that melts my plastic. But what I didn't realize last time we talked, Chad, and, and what I figured out over the last couple of years is how many American families that our brand supports all the way from. So you have the few guys overseas that are melting the plastic and putting it in a box, put it on a boat. From the time it gets on that boat, gets off the boat, wherever we ship it to here, the logistics, the companies to get it from there to us, all of the, the postal workers, the UPSs, the FedExes, the LTL carriers, 
the people that we have here that print all of our apparel, the people that we have here that print all of our decals, the people that run the website stuff, the uh, credit card merchants, like there's so many fingers of this that our small business supports. It's awesome. But people don't really understand that or they don't look at that because the product's melted by a guy in China. Like, well, if you can find me a place here, I would love to do it here, but I don't have a million and a half dollars to get started. Here. And, and you wouldn't pay $150 more for the same cooler that I have now. And it's not, and it's not a quality issue. It's not, um, you know, some people say, oh, it's made in China. It's probably junk. I've also had these conversations where it's like, man, y'all make a quality product. This thing's awesome. It's better than XYZ brand, blah, blah, blah. I'm like, eh, you know, actually it's very comparable to the same brand. Um, similar, similar plastic, similar insulations. We feel like we offer a better product because here's the reason why, but you know, I didn't physically make this product. Well, where are they made? They're made in China. Oh, well, it sucks. Like he just told me it was the best one. Yeah. So it's like a, a mental thing. But then whenever you really sit down and break down how many people, any and not just our company, how many people any small business or big business in the United States supports, even if it has products that are made in Mexico, made in China, made in Japan, it doesn't matter. It supports so many people in this country. It's awesome. Yeah, it's it, people just... Again, man, critics and haters and, and you know, they're loyal They'll to never America. Go away. I understand the loyalty to America. They got to understand that they have the companies like Gator or like Banded that we're Americans. We believe in it wholeheartedly. But we have, you know, we're manufacturers and we're doing what's best right now. And without the ability to manufacture in China or Vietnam or Laos or, you know, different companies, Mexico maybe being one of them, then the people in America wouldn't have the selection of goods and goods that they have to get at from a Macy's and a Dillard's to a Burke, you know, any, any place in America, Nike, the biggest shoe company in the world, you know, they, right. they got to understand it's not going to happen overnight. So, so what is the, what's the overview as far as the, the, the reach, the potential customer base, are you guys looking to go into retail in a dealer base or are you guys, are you guys focused more on the private label, the corporate stuff, the environmental groups or the, you know, the conservation efforts that you're doing with ducks unlimited and, and such, or is there going to be a time where we see Gator on the shelves in one of our retail outlets? Uh, both. We're going to primarily focus on the corporate and the nonprofit side but with me and Mitch's, uh, with our network that we have just from our experiences over the last decade working all over the country, there's a huge market for us on the corporate world and there's a huge market for us on the nonprofit world. But we also just signed our first major retailer and they're going to be like a Southeast United States from the Louisiana, Texas line over towards Alabama, all in that area. They'll be exclusive for that. Um, and that's going to be coming soon, but I didn't want to get, too heavy focus on dealers. We have a ton of applications and you know, it, it is great. It feels good when people want to put your product on their shelves, but we're still fighting the inventory battle. And it doesn't make sense for me to get, if you owned a small business, if you owned a, a small, you know, a, a feed and seed type store and you killed space because these coolers take up a lot of space. So you kill me a whole shelf, you buy your initial inventory, I get it to you, you sell out, you go to reorder and I'm sold out. Well, now you have all of this space that you've killed for me, you're kind of mad at me. You know, I, I can't keep up with what you're asking. And, and plus on the dealer side too, there's so many more expenses and so many more things, you know, everybody's trying to make money. Dealers have a lot more overhead. Um, when you have a business that comes to you or a nonprofit organization, as long as the price is fair, they say they come up to you with the budget. They don't care that $800 out of that budget went to shipping. They just want to know what did they get for that budget. Uh, with with the dealers, they come up and they want to say, well, is there anything we can do to work on a shipping? Like, <laughs> if you can figure it out, please let me know because shipping's kicking our butt. But there's a lot more, I guess, negotiating and, and back and forth with the dealers that we're not really set up to. If I had a warehouse full of inventory, that'd be probably a different conversation. But as you can see, this is that's about what we have left. Right? Really? Yeah. Well, I didn't go anywhere. Where are mine at? Um, back of my truck. 
Are they really? Are the pads ready? Tell let's 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 start our conversation about the new offering of the pads. Are they ready? And if not, when are they going to be ready? No. So for the last uh, everything with this building that we purchased has taken longer. So we it was supposed to be just a really quick purchase. This was a distillery. Without going into the weeds on that, they had a lot of alcohol left in here with barrels, and I can't legally take possession of the warehouse until the barrels are out. And it's all federally tracked. This is a federally bonded warehouse. So I had to find someone to get the whiskey. And that was a challenge. Whenever we finally figured all that out and finally got all the paperwork square away on that. So I'm not hit with a tax bill or, or fined or something. Uh, we got the whiskey out. And then this this place looks brand new now, but it wasn't about a week ago. I've been pressure washing daily for 10 plus hours a day, getting it all clean. I uh, had a buddy that came over and helped me. Now we finally got it all cleaned up. We got the machine delivered. And I've basically been for the last three days, had an electrician in here with me, uh, hooking up all the power. Uh, had to buy several other components, uh, vacuum pump, uh, air compressor, air dryer, separator. I literally, before we started this podcast, just got everything hooked over here to my right. And hopefully this afternoon, I might take this weekend off because I've been working like crazy and my wife's getting ready to leave me. But uh, Way before this weekend. <laughs> way before. <laughs> <laughs> way before. I might take the weekend off, but I do plan on hopefully this afternoon. I have a board behind me that's going to be my spoil board for the, um, the CNC. Hopefully I can get cutting on that today. Okay, so then the answer to my question, when it's do you think? Soon. So will I, have them, soon. will I have them in California next week? No. No, it takes five days to ship to California. It's not my fault you're on the other side of the country. Okay, so when? Muy I, I don't want to give you a date. It's important. Oh, it's, I know. It's very important. I know, important. it's important to everybody. I, I get it. And it sucks because we had, man, we had orders from NWTF. People's pre-order stuff from there, a lot. And whenever, so I had a guy that was cutting our pads for us. And whenever I got back home, they were supposed to have a stack of pads ready for me. I had nothing. So it, it was like, you know what? I can't operate like this. I can't, I can't like beg him into doing the work and I can't wait and I can't go and sit at his shop and run the machine because I have stuff to do. If I'm going to sit at the shop and run the machine, I might as well have my own. That's when we purchased this. It was supposed to take six days. It took almost uh, three weeks to get in. It's just been one thing after the next. Now we have, we're in the middle of this worldwide pandemic. I don't even have a technician is scared to fly. He's in California. He doesn't want to fly to New Orleans because the news is saying if you show up to New Orleans, you're going to die. I've basically been YouTube winging this whole thing, setting it up. So um, if I can get them cut, the laser is going to be over here. The laser part is simple. Excuse me. Um, just a matter of getting CNC rolling. So give me an idea in the nutshell of what the culture is you're building with the Gator brand. Because you come from a state that is probably has as much culture as anywhere in this country as far all the way around. I know New York has a different kind of culture. It's it's more, um, you know, tur it, everywhere's got tourists, but New York is just like a melting pot. You know, you got everybody there. You got you got tons of different things going on in different parts of Manhattan or the Bronx or all the different barrios over in the New York Island, that part of the peninsula and stuff. But Louisiana's got a special part, um, a lot of different things going on with their culture when it's food and socializing and religion mm -hmm. plays a big role. But um, parties and festivals and, you know, the, the Cajun based the Cajun Bay celebrations, the Mardi Gras celebrations, you name it, there's a lot of culture down there. So what is the culture that you're trying to build out of a very cultured location in our country that you want to get out to the masses of what Gator is? Can you answer that? Have you thought about that? I know that you've had to. I know you're busy with other things building the brand, but you guys seem like you're on such a whirlwind of getting product in and it goes out. The name's cool. It looks cool. You got the tabs and the pools that look like Gators. Um, what is the culture though? What are you building into it where in three years from now, when you're settled in this warehouse that you just bought, which is beautiful, by the way, is rocking and you and your brother Mitch are kicking ass and you guys got all this going on. What is somebody going to go and, and say, I'm part of the Gator culture. What's that culture? That's a tough question to, uh, tough to answer. So 
over traveling for the last 10 years or so, everywhere as I went, people asked me about Swamp People. And that show kind of gave people a taste of like Louisiana and, you know, the accents, which I don't have a real thick accent, but the accents are kind of way of living. They show us cooking, they show how the food we eat and all that kind of stuff. I want to kind of keep that vibe, like just be ourselves. Honestly, it's not like I'm trying to create something. It's just, we are. Well, that's what I'm saying is that how do you get the Louisiana culture out? Duck dynasty did it in a way from Monroe. You guys are more Southern, more South of there in the Cajun country. I get it. The swamp people and Troy and all those guys, awesome people, they show it, but we're talking about a box with tabs on it that keeps stuff cold. (laughs) And there's gotta be something that you and Mitch are doing to be able to say, this brand is built into the Louisiana culture. Is it just that you, uh, that you want to build? I think it, it looks like the everyday life of so, so, so you know, socializing camaraderie family, mm-hmm. um, it is. built around all of that. And I think that that's like an important aspect of the brand that it means being with your friends. When you open that cooler, there's something going on that you are, yeah. you're opening up that you're opening up culture, right? Every time that lid opens, here you go. Whether, whatever, whatever your hands reaching in there to get, whether it's, it's a, you know, a meat stick or if it's a cold beer or just fill your cup, your, your gator tumbler up with ice. I just see all this culture spewing out of this brand. That's why I support it like I do. I really like the culture of it. And I don't mm-hmm. even know if we've defined that yet. You know, it's you guys have been right. on such this whirlwind of growth that I don't think you've that you've even had an opportunity to pump the brakes and be like, man, we got to build our culture into each of these coolers that goes out. You know, it's it's hard yeah, to do. Really it, it's a hard yeah. thing to do with a piece of plastic. But you guys have gators on there. You have a cool name. It's just something that I've been thinking a lot about. I've been talking with, I talked with some of the Duck Dynasty guys yesterday on a podcast, and I've just really been thinking like, Louisiana has so much freaking culture. It's unbelievable how much is down there. I talked about- And we want to take advantage of that and try try to catch that in everything we do. And I want our customers all over the place to feel like they're part of that too. That's why so much of our social media- revolves around user-generated content. If you look at our stuff, man, and compared to other brands, you don't see pictures like in a studio or kind of cropped out and put onto like a pretty background. It's all stuff like the Real products time. being used. Yeah. And it's all of our customers using the stuff. And, uh, and I want to include that. Me and Mitch are also very active um, at a lot of events. We go and a lot of people don't realize that we own it. They think that we're like uh, brand reps or sales guys or something. But um, we're very active. We try to do as many events as we can, try to attend as much as we can. We do a lot for our community, uh, kind of unspokenly. We don't, I'm not looking for, you know, a pat on the back about it, but we do the Easter egg hunts for the community. We do the little parties here. We support churches here. We, we support a bunch of things here. And that gets our products in all these places. And then they're like, oh, what is this? And they look us up on social media. They see, get the whole feeling about it. They talk to us. Everything we have kind of revolves around Gator. And it. I, I want all of our customers to feel like they're a part of it. Yeah, and I think that a, a good way to look at it is I, the, what I was talking to Justin Martin about at Duck Dynasty and Duck Commander is when you go to hunting camp, when you go to Canada, I've been all over, you know, the country when guiding in Kansas or Nebraska, Texas, Arkansas, you meet so many Cajuns, Louisianans that come with big groups. They're always in groups, Cajuns travel in entourages (laughs) and they're the, they, they quickly become the favorite of everybody else in camp. They're gathered around. You either love them or you hate them. They're well, it's hard (laughs) to hate a lot of them in hunting camp because their food's so freaking good. Right. So, so they're gathered around a gumbo pot, slow cooking and stirring the roux, drinking a cold drink, cold beer, Telling stories mm-hmm. and making people laugh, making people people feel fuzzy inside. And that's the culture of Gator. That's what has to come yep. out because when that Cajun guy goes to Saskatchewan and he's way up in BFE cooking gumbo over a burner in, in snow in Alberta, that's culture right there. That's like everybody is gathered around the Cajun. So I think that that's like that becomes like the campfire, like gather around, like Gator, gather mm-hmm. around. You know, it almost goes together, gather Gator, gather around, you know, like gator around, like get around. I'm onto something there, dude. I just, I'm oh, coming up that. with this. Yeah. Oh, my, my wheels are turning. <laughs> I'm just thinking like, I'm just thinking like, that's what people like to do when Louisianans are around. They, the, the song, Louisiana, 
you get down the fiddle and you get down the bow. You kick off your kick shoes off your and shoes. you throw them on the floor. Dance in the kitchen till the morning light. Louisiana Saturday. Louisiana well, Saturday. the next verse, yep. my brother Bill and my other brother Jack. Headed for the beer and a possum in the sack. Fifteen kids in the front porch light. Louisiana Saturday. So right there, that whole song that Mel McDaniel wrote and sang is Louisiana culture. Big groups, parties. When they all leave, me and the woman going to slip off to bed. But the the whole thing is wrapped around family and friends celebrating, gathering around, Mm. gatoring around, gatoring around. We're just gatoring. We're just gathering. It's just a gatoring. Instead of gathering, we change it to gatoring. And now we're into something because now people all over the world are gatoring. And it's almost like it goes with Traegerin because now people don't just barbecue, they Traeger. That's right. So now That's we're right. not, now we don't just have a cooler. We have a gather. We got a gatoring. Man, I think I'm on, I think I'm on. That sounds I'll, like a, that sounds like a bumper sticker there. I'll send, I'll send an invoice. I'll send an invoice. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so you mentioned, you mentioned that you're, you might take this weekend off. Give me an idea of what a weekend in Cajun land looks like. Is it what I'm talking about right now? Are you going to, are you going to throw down on some food? We're not going to, we're not going to not, we're not going to do this podcast without talking about food. And by the way, it's 12 and one. I say this a lot on these podcasts. I've been doing these fasts for 16 hour fast, 8 PM till noon the next day. I don't eat a drink a calorie or eat a calorie. And then my first thing almost every day, have you had one of these? I haven't seen those. This is the new cold craft by Jack links. Like this is just like a, you know, one of those little plugs. It's not shameless because I'm eating it, but that's, look at this thing. <laughs> they come, yeah, I've never seen those. They, they come pre-priced two forty nine, right? So the retailer mm-hmm. can't mark it up. They, they come like that from, from Jack links. You just open the seal. I don't know if you'll be able to see, smell this through the computer, pepper, Jack cheese. Mm-hmm. And then on the inside, two thick pieces of Genoa hard salami like it and it's a link which no bread no starch hmm like good like right like good yeah. how you that like good you say that good is that how you say it down there no how do you say that it sounds more like uh you've been hanging out with sammy sabini getting that accent sabini ain't got no accent Oh, whatever. <laughs> dude, we don't have accents yeah. out west dude we've been watching the stories man we see it um that's good that sounds, that's a Cajun. So what is it? A weekend, it, a weekend here now is a lot different than a typical weekend because of just, we're still getting settled in this house. My wife and I built a, a house here. Uh, somebody had mentioned something about sending me a grill as my house only present. I think that truck it, driver got lost. Does it need to go? You told me you're going to let me know in the ha- the grill when you're ready for it. I think is it it's on the, a, is it on the same shipment as my coolers with the pads? I, I was about to say, I think it's on the same shipment as the invoice for Gator and Around. So I, I wonder if we'll get those at the same time. Gator and Around, dude. Do you like that? It's a thing there. Yeah, that'd be cool. <laughs> dude, I just, like gave, I just gave it to you, man. It's kind of like Traeger and Around. So but give me yeah, give me uh, an idea. So we've been doing a, a lot of activities with my kids. My wife's a rock star at it, man. And she um, keeping the kids home and being out of school now. I don't understand how she does it. I, I wake up and leave early in the morning just to get a little break. She unfortunately can't get that break. So I'm sure this weekend I'll give her a little bit of a break, uh, play with the kids, do some activities. We bought a big water slide, hang out, cook something. I'm not sure what. I'm sure it's going to be something that's uh, super unhealthy because that's just kind of how we do on the weekends. But <clears throat> probably got something. I actually just bought a huge – stainless steel pot i think i'm gonna break it in this weekend with what i don't know something with a lot of onions bell peppers just a big cheese big big old uh, chunk of meat we'll see that doesn't sound cajun oh yes it does i'm telling you but yeah i'm gonna say crawfish there's lines wrapped around town right now everybody's social distancing in their cars every person that sells crawfish in this area right now for good friday easter weekend there's cops directing traffic it's crazy. And they're just coming out and dropping the sacks in the back of the truck and you're like passing your money through the window. Like drug deal. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Are you but doing I, crawfish really, this weekend? You're not a crawfish not, fan, are you? I'm not really. No, I'll be honest with you. We, we did crawfish the other day. I uh, did four sacks. And I don't really like to just stand there and eat the crawfish, but I love to cook stuff with it after. Like I don't mind the crawfish meals, but to just stand there and eat, it just it gets old to me. So we sat there and peeled four sacks of crawfish 
and I have a lot of extra and we, we cook different stuff with that. Hmm. Well, I'm going to, I'm going to ask you a favor. What's that? We're going to trade a Traeger for a cooler full of peeled tails. A cooler full of peeled tails. I get you a 10 quart full of peeled tails. That's fine. That's all I meant. A little one. <laughs> we can do that. I'm serious. Me too. When can you ship it? Probably Monday. I'm being for real. You said it now, right here. Look, today's Friday. Ships the trucks already left. They're not going to ship out this weekend. So Monday, I can ship. Are out. they already all peeled? Yeah. Peeled and vacuum sealed in, uh, I think, two pound bags. Oh, dude. I mean, I would love to cook some of that. I'm serious. Will you send me some? So we're just talking about trading. And the trading turned into sending. I seen. No, we were just talking like about. Words. We were just talking about Gatorin. This has nothing to do with the Traeger. This has to do with me giving you that term and <laughs> marketing for. Play your, that tape back. I'm marketing for your. I'm marketing for your company. What's in that cup, dude? Are you already drinking this early in Louisiana? I've been hydrating with water, man. I, I have to make myself. Uh, I get in a working mode. I don't eat anything. I don't drink anything. I just work all day, and I have to like. I sit at my recliner at night, thinking like, dude, I, I ate like three pretzels today and drank nothing and it's just super unhealthy and i could feel my body getting sluggish so usually i drink a lot of worse i'm kind of forcing myself to drink water now your wife doesn't have dinner ready for you when you get home yeah she does so you see this but little i'm gonna try to give her a break this weekend in this little mixer cup i got right here this is my old uh -huh. little handy mountain ops little shaker cup this Another is shameless plug this is what's in it <laughs> a little little <laughs> tiny bit of trader joe's apple juice one tablespoon of zero 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 triple zero Greek yogurt, kale, mm -hmm. kale, spinach, broccoli, asparagus, a full cutie, what is this a, quarantine doing a, to you? A man? full cutie orange, a handful of blueberries, a handful of cranberry or a handful of uh, uh, raspberries, six to seven, five, six, seven ice cubes, and then I I mash all that up in a blender. And I got a, well, I got one of them badass blenders, and I uh, you know the Vita you know the Vitamix is do you, that's not a shameless plug I'm not with them but they're bad to the bone dude they're worth every penny. <laughs> that's, that's three. And now. then I and then I and then after all that's mixed up I take a half a banana and put the half a banana in there and let that go mm -hmm. on slow speed just to make it a little bit more creamier and that's what mm -hmm. I drink I, I drink this green drink every day at noon. Can you see that in the camera? How green it oh, is? Oh yeah. Yeah. And it's all asparagus and uh and kale and broccoli and and spinach just messed up with them fruits. And dude, I'm telling you, you need it's good for your what I'm trying to tell you, Brian, is that you need to start you're 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 moving into your forties now and you need to start taking care of your body and putting good <laughs> greens in it. These yeah. are good greens. Yeah. Good greens. So I want to talk about the Cajun food. Mm -hmm. what is boudin we've said it here before but i want to get a little bit more precise is this putting you on the spot do you know what boudin is so the main thing i know about boudin is that i eat it <laughs> that i that i grill it it's it's like depends on there's several types of boudin there's several different ways to make it depending on where you go there's 10 world's best boudins and they're all different to me so I don't know. It's like dirty rice in a in a casing. What is I'm fixing to? No, Usually, I'm fixing. I know, but you also see right there. You just said I'm fixing. Like something's broke. I'm gonna fix it. The audio sounds wrong. I'm gonna fix it. But Cajuns go, yeah, we're fixing to go to church. Like, what are you fixing? Like, you got to make sure the car runs. Like we're fixing the car so we can go to church. Do you get down or get out? <laughs> like, what do you mean? Like when I'm leaving somewhere? When you get into, when you get to the store, you're gonna get out at the store. Or you're gonna get down at the store. Out of the car? Yeah. Yeah, you get out of the car. You don't get down. I get down. No, you get down on a dance floor. See, this is why <laughs> this is why people talk so much shit about Cajuns and Louisianans is because uh, yonder, where is yonder? How many is y'all? What is fixing to? What what? Okay, I'm wrecking to. So now I'm fixing to go to church, but I'm also you reckon we go to church. So now you want to fix the car, but wreck it before you even get there. Like it, none of that makes sense to anybody. And I want to get a, a little bit of a concept of what that means. I guess it just depends on how down the bayou you are, man. You got a lot of uh, 
we got a lot of different sayings. It's just we shorten in the words. Look, life is only so long. You don't need to spend all your life pronouncing stuff and enunciating like. Okay, so what does properly. I we're reckon we're I reckon. Hey, you want to go to church? I reckon. Time out. That's Alabama. No, that's don't Louisiana. That that's Louisiana. Oh no 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 no. That's North Louisiana maybe. No reckon. That's Louisiana yeah. for sure. Absolutely not. Yonder. Who says yonder? Terry Denman at Mojo. Chad, do you think we ought to go hunt yonder? He's Where's from Louis- Louisiana. What part of Louisiana? That's Monroe, but they say it down where you're from. Above I 10. Phil no, Robertson. We don't say that. Phil Robertson. No, he's Monroe too. As well as above I 10. Yes. Different Louisiana people, man. I'm telling you. That's why I say it depends on how down the bayou you are. The further down the bayou, the shorter look. Life is way too short. We don't waste no, no time speaking any, properly. Any time. We ain't wasting no time. We ain't wasting. This life ain't for yeah. everybody. All right. So, also, give me, how'd you do the crawfish? How do you do a, a true Louisiana Cajun crawfish boil? Do you get a pre mixed boil? What is the seasoning you put in first? How do you start it? You put your pot on top of a flame, right? And and then yeah. what happens from there? Do you, what do you bring to a boil? What's in there? Tell me from the beginning. So, we've been mixing it up a lot and it really just trying different stuff. Um, we get last time we did it. I think we used Chack Bay seasoning mix, maybe a, a Rouse's brand generic, like they have their own uh, white labeled seasoning mix as well. And first, we'll do like a very bland one. We'll, we'll folks, we'll do our vegetables and stuff separate. And then for the crawfish, we'll do the first batch is going to be very kind of mild, bland almost. And that's for the kids. And then after that, the second pot. We don't measure anything. I know I, we do several uh, crawfish competitions here, and it's amazing to see the people break out like the glass beakers and like squeeze orange juice and pineapple juice like to the ounce and like pinch stuff out if they have a little bit too much. We just like open the bag and dump it and get a whole bunch of lemons and just squeeze them, put them in there. How many lemons you put in there? Like a sack. Enough. It's just enough. Yeah. About that much. Wait a minute. So wait a minute. Slow down. You got the water mm-hmm. on a boil, and this is why yep. the water's coming to a boil. You're squeezing these lemons and putting the seasoning in there? Yeah. We'll get the water going, and then when the water's ready, you put the crawfish in there. But you got to have, but you put all the seasoning and everything in before the crawfish go in, right? Right. Yeah. Yeah. Some people put uh, the season, they sprinkle seasoning on top of the crawfish after, and it gets all on your hands and when you're eating it. So I don't, we don't do that. So the water is starting to come to a boil. You take a bag of the seasoning, depending on which one you want to use. You we add, mix it all up before we even before, before you bring we your even boil. Up. Yeah. So and then you're saying that after the kids get their mild ones, how do you make the next batch? You're saying it's spicier. You cut the bag and dump the whole bag in there. So the, put some more liquid crab oil in there. Yeah. And the crab boil has some spice to it. Yes. Yeah. So how spicy do you like your crawfish? I like them. So. I like them way on the spicier side because I don't sit there and pick at them all day. And then the more spice that you have on those tails, whenever you're cooking with them later on, you'll get more flavor out of it. It'll give the food a, a kick without having to add a whole bunch of crap to the food. So when you do a boil, a traditional boil, what are the main accompanying accompaniments, accompaniments? I don't even know how to say that word that go in with it. <laughs> Besides the crawfish, what's in that boil? What else do you Put in so that the, juice and, and, and cook in that juice before you throw it out onto the table for people to come fill their plates with. I just want to make a point real quick before I get into that. If you were talking Cajun, you just say, hey, what else you put in the pot? You wouldn't have screwed it up trying to talk proper and say like big words. But that anyway, so well, you know, you have an accompany, a company. <laughs> what, what, what? See, you still, you still just say, hey, bro, what else you put in there? <laughs> <laughs> what else do y'all eat with the crawfish? Uh, we've been trying different stuff. I'll use uh, like a head of uh, cauliflower and or a can of green beans you take the label off you pop a hole on both sides of the can and that way the juice gets in there you can cook the green beans in there i've done brussels sprouts last time which are actually really good i, I really like brussels sprouts but it, it gave them a good flavor uh we put tamales in them deer tamales mm. uh, my buddy makes them and we kind of they wrap tight three to a bundle and we'll just drop them all in a like a boil bag put the whole bag in there and once it's boiled you're basically just heating them up i mean they're already pretty much cooked uh we put all kinds of stuff in there. We don't really, some people stick to like the onions, the celeries and carrots and uh, maybe potatoes, but we kind of mix it up. And uh, I put garlic and stuff in there too, but try to lay lay down on the garlic because uh, you don't want to smell for the next few days. Mm. 
but I, I don't. It. I don't mind. I love garlic. Yeah, the garlic. I mean, I, I'll sit there and eat it until my wife kind of punches me. But now, do you like corn on the cob in there? Yeah. I'd say my favorite is probably the the artichokes and the corn on the cob. I've never done cauliflower, but I'm doing that. Um, mm-hmm. The sausages, I'm very critical of. What is the best type of sausage that you? Is it andouille that you put in yours, or do you? What do you like to put in that? Because a lot of like, I don't just like to put regular bratwurst in there, right? I, right? I'm very picky on what sausage I put in the boil to accompany accompany the <laughs> crawfish. Yeah. So you don't want to get like a fresh sausage that breaks apart, but we'll go to Bourgeois and get some uh, smoked sausage or maybe some jalapeno sausage or something, green onion, and mix it up. I, I'm not a real big fan of uh, the sausage that comes out of these bowls either, to be honest with you. I'm not. I never am. I'm really. I'm no. really picky on it. And I've I've done them out here where I'll call Johnny's or somewhere and fly two three hundred pounds out and do a big boil out here west, which I got to do that again. Obviously, we couldn't this year with what's going on. We couldn't have a right. social gathering. And this is the time of the year to do it, right? March yep. and April is crawfish season. And, and yep. you get any later than this, and I, I start not trusting them. But on that note, sausage note, what is the meat company that you introduced me to from Thibodeau? Are they in Thibodeau? Bourgeois. Tell yeah. me about this company. Did I tell you a story about – did I tell you a story about I was at a Zach Brown show in L.A., and the artist opening up for Zach Brown was Jesse, Jesse James Decker. Have you ever heard of her? Yeah. Definitely. She's badass. She's got her own apparel line yep. and clothing company and stores in Nashville. Nashville, yeah. My wife, uh, my wife went there. Actually, when we went to NWTF, my wife and uh, sister-in-law went to the store and they loved it. They're so, big fans of her. So she's the first or second cousin to the owners of Bourgeois. Swear on my life. She, we're, we're down at the concert and and we're, she, we're, me and her going back and forth because she's got a cookbook and I'm telling her about the cookbook we're working on. And she's and she's like, yeah, my whole family's from Thibodeau, uh, from Southern Louisiana. And I'm like, oh man, I, I, I work with a bunch of guys down there, duck hunt there all the time. And I'm literally saying it like, yeah, I just now got it. And this was like right when I was eating some of the some of the boudin and I'm like boudin burritos. And she has, dude, those are all my family. Those are my cousins. They've owned bourgeois for this long. And she's talking about, did you get one of the stuffed chickens? She knew everything about the place. And I'm <laughs> like, are weird. you, she goes, yeah, you got to ask them. So w- text them and say, Hey, are y'all related to Jesse James Decker in a way? Cause she was, she was, she knew everything about the company. And I'm like, look right here. You can see it. So I went back and showed her one of my posts where I'm working yeah. with where I'm working with them and tagging them on some of my recipes yeah. out here because you ship me all the stuff. So what is some of the stuff they, they offer? So they recently got hit by a car. A uh, car drove through the front front of the building. Oh, I thought you said and, like uh, No, not the people that went through. The, luckily, nobody got really hurt. But um, ever since then, man, I've been making it a point to go in and get all of my stuff there instead of going to Walmart or supermarkets around here to get my meat. I've been trying to get everything from them and they just have so much good stuff. Um, I literally can't think of something that I, well, I'm a little leery of the blood boudin. I haven't tried that to be honest with you. That's not my thing, but they do have the burritos, the boudin burritos, uh, the jerky is their world famous jerky. I prefer the uh, sticks just it's more like a Slim Jim type of deal. but Just so everybody knows, I prefer the Jack Links. Go ahead, Brian. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> Had to get that in there. Uh, <clears throat> but even like ground meat, man, you, it's amazing how different cooking and eating fresh ground meat as opposed to something that's in the stores that's been through a process that you don't know how long that process has taken. And actually hearing some of the butcher stories behind the scenes is kind of scary. The stuff that we are getting at the supermarkets. Um, I've been getting everything from freaking pork loins and pork chops, whole loins of beef. I mean, steaks, everything. What are the stuff chickens? Good, good that you, what was the stuff stuff that, or the, that's Cajun. What was the stuff stuff that she was talking about? <laughs> <laughs> there's the original bourgeois meat market. And then there's bourgeois specialty meats or bourgeois smokehouse, which is kind of a, the brothers split up and they do two different things. Uh, we support both of them, love both of them. They both put out great stuff. But the stuff stuff that we get is from Mr. John's shop, the Bourgeois Smokehouse. And um, he takes whole chickens and debones them, opens it up, stuffs it with different stuff, whether it's uh, like broccoli and cheese or rice dressing or um, 
cornbread dressing, whatever, puts it back together, sews it up, take it home, put it in the oven. And it, I mean, it's awesome. They have stuffed breads, stuffed chickens, uh, stuffed loins. So they have all kinds of stuff. It's, they're a specialty meat market. So anything you can think of really. I need to get a, an order into them. Are they shipping right now? I believe so. Yeah. Are they, are they fairly priced in your opinion? Yeah. Um, and that's a big thing that people complain about too. It's, I don't know if we want to get into this right now. You might have to cut this, <laughs> uh, like the beef jerky, you know, they'll sell it by the pound. And whenever you're going in and buying something by the pound like that, and I don't remember what the price is, let's say $26, $28, $30 a pound. If you go in the store and you're buying something and you look at it, it might be $8 for a few ounces of beef jerky on the shelf. So if you add up how many ounces you have in a pound and how much that price is, they're actually less expensive than most on the shelf retail beef jerky. But people go in there and they say, oh, the bourgeois is Man, that jerky is insane. It's so expensive. I don't know how people are still buying it. It's, it's really not as expensive as people are acting. But what, what about like a stuffed chicken? I think it's very fairly priced. I mean, I don't remember the price. It's priced about a pound, obviously. But I remember thinking after we cooked the last one, I love the broccoli and cheese one. And the last one, I want to say it was around 10 bucks. And it's it's like, I remember thinking in my mind, whatever the price was, holy crap, my family, of uh, me, my wife, and three kids just ate on this for two separate meals. And there's no way you can eat out this cheaply. You know, like it, it was very good. They have a, a deal there in, in Louisiana also to where you guys are known for different fishes as far as like different ways to serve fish and different fish that you can catch down there, freshwater and saltwater. I've been on mm -hmm. a huge seafood kick lately huge like Traeger in nonstop mainly a lot of white fish I do have some tuna that Brett Brett Cannon sent me some yellowfin that's amazing but mm -hmm. I, I all I've been doing with that is just pretty much eating it raw we're getting ready to start trialing some sushi stuff you don't like raw fish you just gave me a weird look but not at all what what is the fish that you would go to in Louisiana freshwater that you would that you would want to eat you know grilled or blackened every day uh, grilled or blackened. See, that's where you lost me because everybody here fries everything. Um, you guys don't take tough, like man. a speckled trout or a redfish and grill it or blacken yeah, it. I was gonna say redfish, you know, but I'm I'm very weird about the stuff that I eat now, man. So I was at Mitch's house. He he caught a whole bunch of redfish at our camp, and we go and cleaning them. And if he would have never told me that it was worms, that would have been fine. But he's like, man, it's, these are full of worms. And I'm like, the hell are you talking about? <laughs> it's full of worms, man. That's like, that's ligaments. I'm telling myself, like, that's ligament. Or that's something part of the fish that's sticking that's together. That's what you like, caught no, it on, dude. Y'all are bobber fishing with worms? No, 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 no. Yeah. But he's. Dude, you need, it, to, you need to chill out on the way that you approach food. You, you have a negative <laughs> pessimistic attitude towards food. I don't like no. eating crawfish because it's just da, 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 da. I don't like this because it's da, 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 da. And I don't like redfish. Dude, you live in the heart of the best food in the world. And you're literally sitting here telling me that you don't like raw fish. You don't like seared fish. You live in Louisiana. You, I no, know I you, like, but, you, you butter things up and gravy things <laughs> up, but I, do you like gumbo? Absolutely. Do you like yeah. etouffee? Yeah. Okay, so you do like some of it. But even the fish, like we cooked in Nashville, but a uh, hunter came up and cooked for us there. I love red fish like that. I would never eat fish raw. Raw fish just isn't my thing. I, I'm not a sushi. Whenever I go to the sushi place, I get the chicken roll. So it's a uh, cooked <laughs> cooked chicken to make it look like I'm eating sushi like everybody else. But, um, I mean, I've eaten bass, sakale. A lot of people here eat sakale, perch. It's just... Oh, that's good. It's not... It, and it's good. I mean, I, I, I like it I, every bass, now and then. Bass can be okay. A lot of people here eat catfish. I mean, we catch a whole lot of catfish. My dad loves catfish, and it's fun to catch them. We but get you some don't. Really big ones you too. don't. You don't like catfish? No, I love it, man. I do. I, I really do like it, uh, but we mostly fry them. So we'll catch some huge fish that a lot of people wouldn't eat because they're so big. But we just cut them up smaller chunks and, and fry them, and they're good. It's yeah, just not my top pick. It's not at all. Yeah, catfish isn't mine either. I mean, it, uh, 
it, it's edible and I can eat it. I, I don't, I, I love, I'll, I love the socializing that goes on at a good fish fry, but I'd much rather have walleye. If I was going to yeah. do a fish fry, I would much rather do it with walleye and even halibut. Like if you, if you have the guts to fry halibut, which you shouldn't, you should eat halibut, like <laughs> right. really, you know, really grilled and stuff. But I think that if I was going to do a fish fry, I would use walleye in, in the continent of the United States as far as a freshwater fish it. goes. Oh, dude, it's killer, man. Never tried it. Uh, it. It's it's truly, I say all the time, it's the number one freshwater fish in America. Because a halibut doesn't really count. It's an American fish, but it's offshore. Um, mm -hmm. But as far as like in the continental United States, North Dakota, South Dakota, Iowa, Minnesota, Wisconsin, the walleye up there. Dude, you go to a Friday mm -hmm. night fish fry up there. It's the That's bomb. What it is, huh? Yeah, it's yeah. it's good. It's walleye is just a really really clean fish that that doesn't eat a lot of mud and isn't down in the mud like a catfish and like your friend Hannah that goes down there and <laughs> noodles them. Have you talked to her lately? Yeah, we talk to her on a pretty regular basis. How's she doing? She's doing good. Just still being herself, still killing pigs every day and hunting and hanging out with uh, her boyfriend, I guess. Now, is that the boyfriend that was there for a minute and then gone for a second and then back for a minute? Is he the same one that no. was there two years ago at NWTF? They weren't. Uh -huh. they were, I couldn't tell. I, I, I thought I recognized that guy, though. Who was that guy mm -hmm. this year? Cohen. He's uh, with a uh, bone collector. Yeah, that's where I recognize him from. He runs with Waddell, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Okay, that's where I remembered him from. Is he a uh, camera guy? I believe so. I really don't know a whole lot about him, to be honest with you. He seems like a cool dude, but uh, yeah, he seemed I'm not cool. really familiar with him. And what's her dad up to? Are they still running and doing a bunch of stuff together? Oh, yeah, man. They're still... I don't understand how they have so many pigs on this property, but it's like every day he's posting more and more hogs they're trapping. They he are. Just, they're just smoking them. Yeah. Constant. Yeah. And I think he's like, there's no way in hell you'll have this many hogs in this small of an area. Like you have to be just hoarding content to post over and over and over. It's like, no, they really are killing this, <laughs> this many pigs. This is crazy. Are they in Alabama? Yeah. What part? Mm, I think kind of kind of southern is it Dothan maybe or no there was like there was a rodeo that we sponsored in Dothan that wasn't far from them. so I don't remember the exact town but it's there about an hour or so from Dothan that would been. so what were you excited as heck when LSU won the national title again or does that even matter to you is that a big deal down in Louisiana that the Tigers it's continue? a massive deal it's a massive deal man it's Obviously, it's a hometown team. You have to support them. You get beat down here if you don't support the Saints and the Tigers anyway. Or people ridicule you all the time. I love to play sports. I've never been a person to sit and watch TV. So just to sit and watch sports, like, yeah, I support LSU. I love Tigers, go Tigers, whatever. But to sit and watch, like, dedicated every Friday or Saturday or Sunday when whatever team's playing, I've never been a TV person. I'm just I'm always busy. I'm always thinking, especially with the Gator stuff now, I always have stuff to do. But uh, to see the local teams here just kicking butt, even on a smaller local level, our nickel state teams here in Thibodeau, they're doing so good. I mean, it's, it's good. It, it brings a lot more attention to this area. Uh, it opens up new opportunity for us as well. And we've been talking with LSU a lot about being the official cooler of LSU athletics. Um, I don't believe that I'm quite ready for it yet, but the doors open, the opportunities there. And if it happens, then being on the national championship platform just – exposes us that much more too heck yeah yeah they're strong man but what about their coach yeah. though that dude's a live wire eh? he's from uh down the bayou man there's all of them down there he's not far from us yeah uh, so i made him a cooler was, was he the um, same coach that was on the water boy movie with sandler that <laughs> come on man <laughs> is it the same guy that wore you know the guy that wore the coveralls Farmer yeah, friend. You know, you know, you know, is that him is that because i wonder if they no. hired him right off that movie Put your brother on this podcast. He's a little bit more intelligent. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, he's he's the uh he's a dumb oil field worker. I'm the dumber oil field worker. So I got to meet your slightly, wives in Nashville this year. Dumb. We had a good time. How was that concert that yep. night? How what'd you think of Brent Cobb? Dude, I freaking love Brent Cobb. I love everything he puts out and everything he does. And uh I've sent him a few videos from that night that we had recorded and uh kind of talked to him a little bit, but I'd love to do anything, anything at all that we could do with Brent. I'd love to do it. I mean, he's a, he's a great dude. His music's awesome. He's literally playing daily at our shop over here. So 
uh, and the fact that our wives were able to come this year and enjoy it and really see that whenever we go do something like that, it isn't just fun. We aren't just getting a break. They see the work side of it and how much you literally don't sleep and which I'm not, I'm not complaining by any means, but just for them to be able to see that it's not all fun and games, it was awesome. And for them to be a part of the concert and kind of see it there and not kind of see it as, you know, like Gator's a lot bigger of a brand and we have a lot bigger platform than my cell phone operating Instagram in Thibodeau, Louisiana. You know what I mean? Yep. It's a lot, it's a lot bigger. There's a, way more people meeting the people that we've been talking to for years on social media or meeting the people that we've met there the last couple of years um, when we go up with you guys and kind of like seeing old friends again. The fact that uh, Andy was there <laughs> and, and after my wife was like, who is that guy with the guitar? I'm like Andy Griggs. It's like, like, I feel like I should know him. I'm like, I guarantee you, you know him. And she starts like looking up some of his music and she's just like smacks me. I cannot believe you didn't tell me who that was. Like, we should have got a picture with him. And I'm like, no, you got to play it cool, man. You don't go there like <laughs> fanboy and over fangirl and over everybody. You know, you just got to be like, hey, man, appreciate you coming. But we absolutely should have got a picture with <laughs> And And this literally is the strangest thing. I, there's a word for this and I can't think of what it is. But Yonder. ever since then, he is it's not yonder. <laughs> ever since then, his songs pop up constantly on Pandora or Spotify or whatever she's listening to at the house. And it's like subconscious. Now we're noticing that it's Andy. And I mean, it was just, that was a special night for us too. Oh man. Late nineties, early two thousands, Oh three, somewhere in there. Do that dude. He, I'd see him live and he just would mesmerize crowds, man. He's, he, yeah. he, he still, we don't really catch Andy like in the best environments. Cause we got him singing in a loud place or a bunch of people just like yep. requesting, you know, Hey, do Waylon. Cause he can sing Waylon. You know, he was tight with Waylon. He, he, really? he, he would go to Waylon's house. He recorded the duet with Waylon. He'd write with Waylon. He, Waylon would call him Hoss. He'd call Waylon Hoss. I mean, he was, he's, he is as country as they get. And his story's great. If you haven't heard the podcast, but he he can sing like an angel. He truly is a yep. professional, professional singer. And, yeah, that's very good. And um, I, we're just blessed to be able to do. I mean, one night he's singing with Leith Lofton at the Palace there, and Bobby Johnson, and then the next mm -hmm. night Brent Cobb's rocking with Leith Lofton, and you've seen Jamie Johnson at these things. And we were going up there this week, the April seventeenth, and I was having dude up. You wouldn't even believe who was going to play the party at Whiskey Bent. It was going to be unbelievable, dude. And yeah. we had to. Obviously, they canceled the NRA. Did you know NRA was back in Nashville this year? So April 17th, the weekend, we were I was going there for Benelli, but Bobby Johnson and I and Ben Ratliff were going to throw a party at Whiskey Bent with mm -hmm. Barrett, the owner, and it was going to be, oh, man, I'm telling you, like some, it's, it's going to go down next NWTF if, if this I coronavirus our, is uh, gone. I guess our invite's still in the mail. It must be on that same pallet. No, the man, they canceled it three weeks ago. I was going to tell everybody. <laughs> well, there, you guys would have just been able to come up and go to the party. There's, right. I'm not. We don't have right. a booth at NRA. No, and just to go and hang out and just. Oh yeah, you all would have been told to come yeah. up because I was. I mean, it was going to be, dude. I'm talking legit, legit. And but anyway, I just podcasted with Brent the other day. And ha, did you listen? Have you heard his new song? Have you listened to it? Yeah. Is it. it not the most simple? Like, what is he doing? And then all of a sudden you're like, holy <laughs> shit, what did he just say? What did yeah. he just say? I mean, that, that, yep. that song just blows my mind every time I hear it. Um, I can't wait for that whole album to come out. Uh, he played uh, live the other day and I was watching it and he played a couple songs on did there. Did he play Little Things? I've heard Little Things. I don't remember if it was on there or not, but really like it. This podcast that we're getting ready to launch, he does it on there. It's on the new album. I've, I think that, that might have been where I heard it last. Was I think he might have posted a little bit of that. He yeah, was singing on there because it's not but, out yet. But that's he, a good um, song. he, uh, his. I've I've heard the new album probably three to four hundred times now. He sent it to me. Right. <laughs> he sent it to me three weeks ago, and I've listened to it three hundred times a bit. Brian, I go. I can't go to sleep at night without hearing your songs at least once during the day. He goes, really? I go, dude, I'm telling you, I have to listen to shine on rainy day or the Providence, Providence Canyon album or mm -hmm. your old, or your older albums and the stuff you did with whiskey Myers. Um, dude, he's got this duet with this cat. Have you been, been, been watching me promote Adam hood lately? Mm -hmm. Get Adam hoods music and get his stuff with Drake white. 
um, this song right or not with Drake White with with Brent Cobb. Brent, I just said yeah. I just said Drake White because he just texted me. Um, name drop. Yeah, no shit. That was a name drop. I, <laughs> Lord, I apologize. Be with the starving pygmies <laughs> down there in New Guinea. I want to show uh, you. I want to show you. Um, I, I, it's funny that you said. Have that you heard? Have you I heard Kyle Daniel? Almost the same thing. Kyle Daniel. I don't think so. Dude, look up Kyle Daniel. I'm I'm getting it for you right now. I'm trying to find it. Brent turned me on to this song today. Get this song right here. This is a an older artist named Guy Clark. You ever heard of Guy mm-hmm. Clark Texas music? Yeah. That album right there. It's called It's called Texas Cooking, mm-hmm. and the song is number uh, four. No, number two. Anyway, comma, I love you. Oh, mm-hmm. dude, you just sit there and we'll go, oh my gosh. Like this is, it's so, <laughs> so perfect. Um, but Kyle Daniel, he's got some songs with Brent Cobb. Dude, Brent's mm-hmm. just got it. Brent just he does. freaking, yeah. he just effing has it pure, just straight up. I love them all. J- Least new al- album is freaking badass. Um, yeah, we're is. just so lucky. We're so lucky to be wrapped up into this lifestyle and, and, and being able to, you know, ha- have Gatorins and, and Gatoring around and, and, and just, you know, camaraderie. You feel, you feel me throwing all those in, you know, we're just Gatoring. <laughs> You can use that, buddy. Gator. This has been fun. Yeah. Brian McGee, Gator Coolers, G A T R, no O in there. Check them out at gatorcoolers.com on Instagram at Gator Coolers. Buy a cooler, take a picture, get a video, get your kids sitting on it, reeling in a rainbow trout or a brown trout or a speckled trout or a redfish, whatever it is. Get them their content so they can repost it. They love the community. They love the culture. They're building it. It's happening right now in America, the American dream. Two brothers have a vision. It starts off at just getting a few of them for some gifts for some people, and it turns in to what I consider the hottest cooler brand in the country. We all know Yeti's badass and nobody will ever have a bad thing to say about Yeti. They are awesome. They weren't the original in my opinion, but they are an awesome brand. There's several of them out there. I love the culture of Gator. I love the family of about it. I love their vision. I love their work ethic. I love their tenacity. I love their passion. I love their commitment. I'm just going on and on. What I love about the McGee brothers, I know their wives now. We all get along. We all love the same music. We all love Gatoring and Gathering. Gatoring and Gathering. That's what we do, boys. <laughs> I'm going to have Brent Cobb write a song. Hey, and just so you know, Brian McGee, I wrote a song the other night and I sent it to, Uh, I'm letting this out of the bag. I hope Brett doesn't get mad at me for saying this, but I sent it to Brent Cobb. I said, Hey, look, this takes a lot of guts for a Westerner duck hunter. Cause I've written a couple. I wrote the theme song for the foul life, my foul life and one called bullet. And, um, I've written other ones. Like one was called the gambler that the guy, Kenny Rogers sang and, um, (laughs) rest in peace, Kenny. But no, I sent him the song, and dude, and he goes, this is good. He goes, you're a songwriter. And I'm like, really? And he, I'm serious. He said, you know, he probably Come was, on. he was probably on his fifth drink that night and but whatever. He's, he's, yeah. he's, he's putting the finishing touches to it right now. And he's going to send is it back. Is it better than that, uh, rap that you posted the other day? Did you not like my, me and my daughter rapping? <laughs> did she not flow on there? She, she did an awesome job. Yeah. You didn't think I did? Come on, man. <laughs> Dude, I, I especially like I especially like the comment that says unfollowing and somebody responds, Oh no, please don't. Your follow means so much. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know who put that on there. I don't know who put that on there. That was awesome. I don't know who put that on there. All right, hey, check I, out. But look, I told Brent the same thing that you told him. And I said, Look, I don't want to come across like I'm I'm obsessed or anything, but I just want to let you know, man. I think you're awesome. I love the music, I love everything you put out. Basically, Almost word for word what you said. You know what he says? What? Yeah, man. Thanks for giving a shit. Yep. <laughs> that was it. That's like, how he, he is, dude. Like, I'm telling you. He's, he's just happy people likes it. I know the Brent Cobb that is. The, he's got an attitude like, I am a bad mother, you know what. Like, he yeah. he has it. Because, dude, Leith is, has unbelievable cl- clever lyrics. Mm-hmm. Even Leith will tell you Brent Cobb is on a different level of songwriting. And that is the truth. Like verbatim, Leith Lofton told me Brent Cobb will go into the Songwriters Hall of Fame before Chris Stapleton does. So if you That's think about statement. those words of a guy like Leith Lofton that can write a country right. song, if right. you listen, if you slow down and listen to the lyrics of Brent Cobb, and I had them written down because I was so mesmerized by the world is ending. When he talks about how we're all praying all of a sudden in that song and, mm-hmm. and, 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 and it might be time to cleanse. I was like, 
it might be time to clean out, you know, like, and I was like, what yep. are you saying? So I talked to him, wait till you hear that. I'm like, what do you mean by all of this, Brent? And where he was when he wrote it and what he was feeling. Mm-hmm. I mean, he wrote that song in 2011. It was, it was a while back. Yeah. Yeah. Almost 10 years ago. Yeah. That's crazy. And to it's me. weird how it fits now. I know. It's like he saw it. The yeah. world is ending <laughs> again. You again? want me to sing it to you? Hey, I like man, that tumbler. Look at that tumbler. That thing's sharp. Old Steve Holloway. He's about a different cat, right? Dude's on it. He's on it. That thing's so slick. He is on it. Here, hold that up again. I'm going to get a little video of that. Hold on. Hold on. Bring it down and then bring it up. Man, I got to teach you how to do content all the time. Dude, I thought you had this content going. Yeah, boy. Brian McGee. He. Gator Coolers, gatorcoolers.com. Check them out. Live the culture. We be gatoring. We're having a gatoring. A gathering. Having a gatoring. gatoring. That's our new thing. Appreciate you, buddy. This has been another great episode of This Life Ain't For Everybody podcast. I'm Chad Belding. That's Brian McGee with Gator Coolers. Tom, hit that button. This is our boy, Leith Lofton. What you gonna do when the money's all gone? Y'all take care. I'd rather be poor living off in a hole Rich as hell without a soul Life on earth